Tonight, I have the great pleasure of introducing Carol Caffrey. So, hello, Carol. Hello, Marion, and thank you very much. It's, it's lovely to be here and to be included among so many really extraordinary women. Well, I'm sure <laughs> so I describe and, myself. With. And, and we, we can't actually see you, but we know you're there. And oh. I, I, think, I think there are, no, we can see you, but we can't see your audience. Oh, but, right, right, right. But a lovely audience of up to 100 people watching this right now, and there'll be others watching later on once it's um, videoed. So, Welcome to you all. I just need to say one or two um, housekeeping things. Uh, Natalie is in the background, um, um, masterminding all the technology, and she's going to switch off the chat function um, so that when people make comments, it doesn't interrupt the flow up here. Um, but then at the end, it'll come on again. So if you've got any, um, any questions, any comments, particularly questions for Carol, that would be lovely to have them, and we'll leave time for them at the end. So save, save your thoughts, and when we're coming near the end, please ask questions, and we'd love to make it a broader conversation. So, first of all, to introduce Carol. Carol um, has become my friend in the four years since we met, um, but I remember very vividly the, the first time we met, I saw her on stage. This was in Much Wenlock in Shropshire, um, where there is a poetry festival. It was going for seven years, and unfortunately that was the last year when I was really lucky to catch it. And on the first night they had a, a big lineup of really well-known poets reading their poetry and, and to a packed auditorium. And then they had a few local poets as well, and Carol was one of those. And I sat there in the audience not knowing a single person, either, either in the audience or on stage, and I listened. And um, it was interesting, every poet was interesting, and, but what really touched me was Carol's reading. So afterwards I went looking for her and boldly introduced myself and said I really liked her poem. And then she kindly came to my session that I was doing, which was about the Urdu poetry in, in Uncertain Light. And from there, we got to know each other. So, um, she has the highest recommendation from me as a poet. She was really the outstanding person that evening, even though the others were well-known poets, prize-winning poets. And at that stage, she wasn't a published poet in the sense she had had a lot of poems published individually, but not a book. And now I'm delighted to say she has a, a collection of her own poems published. So we'll hear about that later. So Carol, first of all, you, why don't you um, say something about uh, that event in Winlock. It was quite a big event for you, wasn't it? Oh gosh, it was. Um, it was the most extraordinary evening. There was, there was magic in the air that night uh, in all sorts of ways. And I still look back on it as the high point. Well, the publication of the book is up there as well, but one of the highest points of my life as a, as a poet in my life, even apart from being a poet. Um, I was greatly honoured to be invited by Anna Adrida, the, the founder of the festival, to be the support on that opening night for Daljit Nagra and Lem Sisse. And there were so many other people who could have been invited, but she, she chose me. And I spent a lot of time choosing which poems to read and so on. I think if I remember rightly, it was 10 minutes. So I got on that stage and from the moment I opened my mouth and so it was nothing to do with me particularly, but there was a welcoming and an electricity in the audience that night. People wanted it to go well for everybody. I got that sense. They seemed to love what I was, was, was reading. There was a great rapport. And, you know, when I look back on it now, I sort of get tingles again. It was really special. And I remember vividly you coming to me in the corridor outside. I'm not sure if it was at the interval or at the very end. I've been feeling it was the interval. And you very bravely introduced yourself to me and explained you were doing that, the session the next day in Much Luck. So I was determined to go and see if this stranger approached me. And that, that evening, so many people came up to me and said, where's your book? Where's your book? Where's your book? I had to keep saying, well, I don't actually have a book yet. And it's not that easy to get a book published. It's hard enough to get individual poems and stories published. And for every acceptance you get, there are so many rejections. So 
I was determined after that to, to keep going, to keep trying. So eventually this year it happened. And I think one of the other things about that evening was it was very clear that you were an actor. I don't know ah. if you'd like to be called an actor or an actress, but there was I don't mind. I don't mind either way. <laughs> there was something about the way you, I mean, everybody who was reading that evening had a dramatic person, uh, personality, which they projected, but there was something very quiet, uh, very, very confident about your, your quietness as you read the quiet poems. You had no need to demonstrate. Uh, you, you were letting you were letting the emotion of the words speak for themselves and and then there was one which was hilarious actually you suddenly, <laughs> suddenly you know suddenly we were aware this was an Irish woman with a full Irish accent and it was a hilarious silly poem in a way compared to the other ones but it, the the contrast I, and then I later on heard from other people yes Carol's an actress as well and she's got a one-woman show and I thought, well, this woman's got a real story because it was clear also from what people were saying is that both as a poet and as an actor, you'd come to that in middle life. And that was the story that really interested me and that I'm sure everybody listening will also feel the power of. Because I think most of, most of us women who, the, those of us who have families um, have perhaps started out adulthood with something that we wanted to do or something that we were professionally trained to do and then put it on hold to a certain extent when the family was there or sometimes to a large extent and then how do you get back to that and the idea that you'd done that and created this whole creative life for yourself was very very interesting to me so I'd like to go back to that but I'd like you to talk a little bit about how you came to poetry when you came to writing poetry was there anything in particular, you know, what sort of age were you? What sort of stage was your family? Right. It was probably sort of the mid naughty, sort of 2007, eight onwards. I mean, at school, I'd always loved English, as most writers will have done. I did English and history in my degree in, in university, and I had taught English and history as a subject. But when I started really writing again, I in seriously, which was in the mid noughties really, uh, I'd been away from all that for a long time, about 20 years or so. Um, and it was a series of coincidences really, or small steps. Um, at the time, my eldest brother, David, I, I had two brothers and two sisters who sadly all passed away within a short period of time um, in the late noughties. But at the time, my brother David had been running a schoolhouse in um, a small village on the Bearer Peninsula in West Cork. Uh, he renovated the old schoolhouse and turned it into um, a centre for foreign students to come, enjoy the language, the landscape, the people, learn about Irish music, history, art and so on. Um, and he'd had a series of poets come every year when my children were little and it wasn't so easy for me to come over in the summer. English school holidays didn't coincide with Irish school holidays. So my other sister spent more time in the summer in this place, Allahy's, when my brother David was there. The patron of the schoolhouse was John Montague, uh, a very eminent Irish poet who only died a few years ago. And he had several poets come over the years that I sort of did, didn't become aware of really. But this summer, the summer of 2007, David was quite ill and was in the middle of running a course for American university students from, I think it's Pennsylvania actually, I can't remember exactly, so don't quote me, Penn, Penn State University. And um, the poets who were uh, taking part in workshops and readings as part of that summer school were there as usual in the May, June of that year. And David was quite ill actually and needed to go into hospital. So I came over to give a hand and the poets stayed on very kindly to help continue the course. And those poets were Paula Meehan, who wrote the play Music for Dogs, and Theo Dorgan, her partner, both very well respected poets. And um, so I got to know them. I made sure I came the next few years. David sadly died that summer. Um, but Trish, his wife, who had been very ill herself for a year after a brain aneurysm, kept the school going in the summer months for French students who came in July, teenagers and the American university students in May and June. 
So, and the Paula, Mian and Theo Dorgan and Tony Curtis, a third poet, wonderful poet, would come every year. Um, so I got to listen to a lot more poetry, went to their workshops that they did for the students, to the readings that they gave for everybody in the village. Um, so poetry was, was becoming more a part of my life. And at the same time, um, Liz Lefroy, who is a very good poet here in Shrewsbury, who's a friend, uh, started a monthly poetry event where she invited guests to read and opened out the evening to open micers. Um, and at the same time, of course, the Wenlock Poetry Festival was going on, which was founded by Anna Drida. And the patron of that was Carol Ann Duffy, who used to come every year, most years certainly, to give readings. So we got all these wonderful poets coming to much Wenlock. Liz started her event and I remember reading a poem for the first time at one of her open mics. I had never, ever done anything like that. But because it was a small, informal, very welcoming situation, I felt able to do it. Um, and it probably was another four or five months before I read again, did another maybe two poems, something like that. So all of this was going on at the same time as very difficult family things were happening with my brothers becoming ill and my sisters eventually. It's all a very complicated story. But between 2007 and 2011, David and Peter died July and the end of the year in 2007. Then Sheila and Linda died between the summer and December of 2011. And I think like most people, when you have profound loss, which this was, um, you look for ways to deal with it or to explain it or to get through it in some way, or even just to escape it. So kind of, it was really all of those things. I'd always dabbled in writing and I had done the odd course off and on and had wanted to be a writer, but never done enough specifically and purposefully about it until then. I started to write poetry at first about my family, um, as a way of just unloading some of the awful grief and, and sadness. And I'm sure people are aware that during this pandemic, people have turned to poetry an awful lot. There is something in it that connects with our most basic emotions, our most basic primeval needs almost. So I started experimenting with a few really just privately for myself. And then um, I got a little bit more confidence reading at, at, at the poetry, open mic and Shrewsbury poetry. Um, and then there seemed to be a burgeoning after that within the whole area of Shropshire that you have remarked on, um, Marion, that the, another monthly event started in just over the border in Wales, another one an hour down the road that way. There seemed to be about four or five monthly events of poetry readings um, and all of them had open mic opportunities. So you began to get a little bit of a circuit going um, and you might be sure of five minutes here or 10 minutes there and so on. But certainly a big breakthrough for me was being invited by Anne at that time to, to support the headliners at Much Wenlock. And then I started to get a few guest slots and so on. And, and you start, I kept submitting and you start to get some acceptances which are great it give you a sense of validation and because there are times when you get another rejection say oh no am I fooling myself altogether and why do I bother but partly it for me as a way out of the family situation or a way of dealing with it um it was a lifesaver absolute emotional mental lifesaver Really. Well, I, I think one of the one of the things about that poem that I heard you read in in Much Winlock, I think it was one of the ones about your sister um, remembering her or, mm. or feeling the loss. It, it's so delicately done. I'm getting goose pimples now as I think about it because there's there's nothing there's nothing overly over the top emotional or dramatic about the way you 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 have dealt with it in poetry. You captured very delicate moments, very very tender feelings and um, and you share them and I think it's a it's a it's a wonderful thing and this book is full of them so um, uh, Natalie is giving you the details of where you can get hold of this afterwards it's a it's a they call it a pamphlet 
Than yes, a pamphlet or a chapbook. It's think, half a collection. Because it's yeah. small, because yeah. poetry is small. But when when Carol says that she was submitting, she was sending in particular poems or short pieces of prose to journals which publish poetry. It's you know I'm 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 a published novelist, but it's been a real struggle to to get there, and that's partly what my my book Journeys Without a Map is about is about that struggle. But for a poet to be published is you know there's very little market in poetry, very few people buy poetry books, mm -hmm. um, and and I think there's something special about you know it, most people are introduced to poetry at school, but I think probably quite a small proportion of people carry on reading it for pleasure as adults. And mm. I think what's so lovely about Carol's story is that it was live poetry that, that brought it back to her. It was hearing, yeah. it yeah. was a spoken word. And if, you know, in cultures that I've been in touch with where poetry is very powerful, it's oral poetry, it's spoken poetry. One of my novels is, uh, is set among Somali refugees and the Somalis have a fantastic um, repertoire of oral poetry, which people memorize just from listening to it recited a couple of times. And then Urdu and Persian do as well. And these are oral cultures. So I think what's beginning to happen in Britain is poetry is becoming oral again. It's becoming spoken. What it is. It is. And I think it gets to more people that way. It reaches a bigger audience, certainly yeah. these days. I mean, in Ireland, we have the tradition of the Shanachi, uh, which is like the storyteller sitting around the fire. And, and our tradition goes back to a very oral a tradition as well from um, Middle Ages or something. So, yes, uh, I think a, a poem that's read aloud or spoken aloud is very different to one that you read yes. just to yourself silently internally on yes. a page. Yes, absolutely. And it's mm. it's sometimes quite hard to take in because it's moving, it's like music, it's moving past mm. you and you can't stop it. Sometimes mm. you want to go and read it afterwards. It's mm. nice to have both. Mm. But I think mm. uh, and because you because you're an actor, you you you're used to using words in a way where people are going to respond to the spoken word. And I think mm. it all blends together. So tell us a little bit about where the acting comes in in your life. Where did that start? Uh, oh, gosh, I think acting, probably the whole creative life, but certainly acting is a bug that you are born with. It's in your blood and it can be a wonderful thing and it can be a bloody awful disease. Um, I should say I, I always loved... There's a bit, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a very shy person and in social situations, I'm very awkward and I'm not great at small talk and so on. But hidden beneath all of that is a show off. I think you need <laughs> to show off to want to be an actor. It's not even so much showing off, you you're crave approval and, you know, well done, sir, sort of thing. I mean, at school, I'd be the class clown. Um, and I'd always go for a cheap laugh in a situation, maybe to diffuse tension or something. And I took part in, in school plays. Then when I left school, um, not really knowing what I wanted to do, but I kind of followed in my brother Peter's footsteps, who was the second eldest, there was David then Peter. Um, and Peter had been to UCD and had been very active in the drum soc, drama society there. So I basically wanted to go to university to join drum soc. Um, and if at the end of it, I ended up as a teacher, fine, you know, I could make decisions later. So I went to UCD and for the first year I was auditioning for there's, plays. There's Carol, can I stop you? That's University College Dublin. Sorry, University College Dublin, thank you. Yes, forgot where I was for a minute. <laughs> um, yeah, I auditioned. I didn't say I was Peter Caffrey's sister because Peter would have left a couple of years before that, but he was still well remembered because he'd been a huge star in, in Dramsock. Um, and I got parts sort of on my own, really, without trading on the family name. Um, and so I've always loved it and I, I did a lot of it in university and they probably were the happiest days of my life. They were great care for years, didn't do an awful lot of studying. Um, and for a few years after graduating, I, I taught in Nigeria for a year. I did English language teaching in France for a year because my brother David was there. I did sub teaching back home in Dublin, but all the while, I still was looking to see what was happening on the acting scene. How can I break into it and so on? Uh, Peter by then had established, was beginning to establish a very successful career himself. Um, 
And I kept on him, come on, Pete, bit of nepotism here, bit of nepotism, do something <laughs> for me, you know. And the bugger never did really. But I, he was so easygoing, Peter, you know, he'd be busy all the time. He was in London a lot of the time. But anyway, things happen, you know, by accident, I think. Most life is an accident. I was in um I got a part I got a, a gig as an extra in Amadeus in the Gate Theatre in Dublin. Uh, Peter had one of the small parts in it and they were looking for extras and he told me about it so I was an extra. This story doesn't end up with me going on as as understudied and coming back a star, no, but it does lead to something else. Um, one of the people, one of the cast in Amadeus at the time had recently been working with a company called Moving Theatre and they were professionally funded by the Arts Council. They toured communities, worked with them, but also put on professional shows with professional actors. And he knew they were looking for another body. It didn't matter if it was male or female to join the company for the next contracted period. Um, and because I was chatting to him in the green room or something, I heard about it. And Peter said, they need somebody who can play the piano and I could play the piano. So I auditioned for them. I ended up working with moving theatre off and on for the next six, eight years or something, which got me my professional experience, my equity card and so on. And that was all really from just being an extra in a play, you know, no lines, just walking on, walking off. This business is very much who you know and contacts and networks and being in the right place at the right time. I've never been in a hugely glamorous, wonderful right place or time, but any gig I've got has kind of been by chance because you're out there talking to people and you're trying to keep your ear to the ground. So I got, I got, I did work with Moving Theatre. I worked with a theatre and education company, um, and I there was a television series and RTE, the National Broadcaster, that I got a, a regular part in, but it was cancelled after one season. That doesn't mean I was working constantly all the time. I was more often out of work. These were contracts, you know, fixed contracts for six months here, nine months there, whatever. And in the for the fallow periods, Annie, who was the artistic director of Moving Theatre, and I, um, we worked well together improvising and devising material for shows Moving Theatre did. So we decided, why don't we try something our ourselves? So we actually formed ourselves into a comedy duo and we called ourselves the Body Beautifuls. And we had great fun touring um, women's clubs, um, late night comedy, arts festivals and so on. But again, it would just be a few gigs a year. You couldn't live on it, you know, if you had no other sort of means of support. Um, so, so I considered myself in those years a professional actor, you know, and I said to myself, well, I might as well be an unemployed actor as an unemployed teacher because I never had a permanent teaching job either wasn't for the want of trying but it just never happened so that was my life um and for various reasons when when my first marriage ended and I then met my my present husband of 29 years or something um I came to live over here in Shrewsbury um knowing nobody knowing uh nobody anyway and certainly nobody in the acting business and not being great at initiating anything and wanting to, to have a family as soon as possible because I was in my late 30s at this stage um, when I was lucky enough to become pregnant twice. Uh, I knew that was my priority. I wanted that to be my priority. But it doesn't mean that the disease in your blood has gone away. It just means you, you try and keep it tamped down. <laughs> I think that's mm. such a familiar feeling for so many people. Mm. I remember when, when my, oldest, I think my oldest daughter was born, um, we were living in Zambia at the time. No, it must have been the second one. Uh, we were living in, the, in Zambia at the time and there was a, 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 a doctor who came on the rounds um, in this small cottage hospital where my child was born. And I heard her talking to other mums and she was talking about her children and I realised she had children of about eight or ten or something. And there she was, this professional doctor, and she was talking so lovingly about being a mum as well. And I thought, oh, my God, it's possible. You know, the, the things that one's put on hold, one could possibly one day get back, back to them. To. 
-hmm. And I think it's it's really hard for people to hold on to that when they, you know, when they are willingly, or in some cases not so willingly, um, prioritizing being there for their children in mm. those early years. But uh, and then and then of course it's so much harder to come back because because you've all the, got all those gap years and you've lost confidence and you've lost the links and mm -hmm. things have changed and so on. We all know that. So mm -hmm. the real question, Carol, is how on earth did it happen that you did come back? Um, well, it was a question of survival, emotional and otherwise, I think, Marion, is a question of having to or realizing quite late in my life, actually, this, yes, is what I want to do. Um, like for those years between 2006, when David became ill and Sheila was diagnosed with cancer, to 2011, when Linda was the last to die, the whole focus obviously was on them and caring for them when I could, or being relief carer when their families needed a break and so on, because we were all scattered. Like Linda was in Manchester, Sheila was in Dublin, Peter ended up in Manchester, David was in Paris. So and um, his wife was in a coma in Toulouse Hospital for a lot of that, you know, until she came back. Peter was divorced, had no children and had a, had a stroke at two, in 2000. So he was aphasic and, and hemiplegic. Um, so he needed a lot of care. Um, so everything was on the family. And then there was all the dealing with with the losses afterwards. And it was then when I, you know, as I described earlier, started writing and so on. And I realized that this is what was keeping me sane. This is what was keeping me going. So the writing certainly was the first route out of the depths of despair, but also um, the first forays into seeing how I could do this, you know, professionally. And I don't mean make money necessarily, though that would be nice, but but to be professional in how I how I approached it. And the acting was a, almost an accident. Again, you know, there are happy accidents in life. Um, I organized um, a fundraiser, or like a, a memorial, if you like, for Peter in Dublin um, in aid of the Irish Hospice Foundation. While he hadn't died in a hospice, my sister Sheila Wood and my father had, and he got palliative care. Um, at the end of his life and the hospice has always been very close to me so um, we organized a fundraiser and because P Peter had been well known in theatre and film and television in Ireland we were able to get a lot of names if you like to come along and perform and those who couldn't wrote something for the program like people that he'd worked with in the early days who'd gone on to huge fame and fortune like the Jim Sheridan and Gabriel Byrne and Liam Neeson. He started with all of those and they wrote lovely things about him for the program. So among all the, the guests from music, theatre and film at this memorial night, which was to raise money for the hospice, Annie and I decided, um, why don't we do one of our old sketches from the Body Beautiful's days? And I said, yeah, why not, you know? So we resurrected one of the sketches Oh, it was very funny, but it's it's very impolite. So I, even if I could remember any, I won't quote it here. But anyway, we did the sketch. It was just one sketch, like probably about two minutes in the middle of all this glittering night. Um, and we had such great fun doing it. And it had literally been at least 20, 25 years since either of us had worked in the business. Annie in those years like we'd lost touch for a number of years and then found each other by accident long before all this. Um, Annie had become a psychotherapist and was a practicing psychotherapist. Um, and that was how she made her living and how she lived her life. And I'd been a mother and then a teacher once the children went back to school part time and so on. Um, and it was like, I don't know, opening, dusting off the covers of an old book that had been buried somewhere in a deserted house to find, oh, like the secret garden, the secret gardening opening up. We had such a ball just doing those that sketch again. We said, let's work on something else. And she said, I'll direct it and you do it. So she was a director during Moon Theatre days. So to try and cut a long story short, um, I searched and searched for something that would be meaningful to both of us 
And I had bought, uh, some years previously, Paul Amin's trilogy of plays, um, which was called Music for Dogs. Uh, it had three plays in it, and I don't think I'd actually read it. You know, sometimes you buy books, um, or certainly at readings, and you never get to read them until you find them. I found this book of three of her plays that had been published, and I read the one that has become known as Music for Dogs. In the trilogy, it was actually called Janie Mack is Going to Die, but I didn't want that as a title for a play. I wanted people to come and see. So I said to Paula, can I call it the trilogy name Music for Dogs? Because it's all about music for dogs, the, the play. So I sent it to Annie. I said, what do you think? And she loved it. And Paul, she knows Paula as well. So there was the connection with Paula from both sides with us. There was the script, which was really, really funny, really sad, beautifully modulated between both those emotions. Set in Dublin, it, it rang so many bells with me and what my family situation had been, even though Janie and I are very different characters. Um, we said, let's work on this. So that's how the whole thing started. And, and I'll just I'll just tell people right now that, I mean, the key thing is it's a one woman play. So you could do it entirely on your yeah. own. Yeah. You didn't have to assemble a company or get anybody exactly. to employ you. So it was mm. a real independent thing. And luckily, Paula had written a one-woman play. It's about half an hour. Mm. And as mm. you say, I mean, it is absolutely touching and funny all the time, both. And the perhaps you'd like to tell me, I mean, Music for Dogs is such an odd title. Perhaps you'd <laughs> like to just, without, without okay. giving away too much, just tell okay. me why it's called that. Why it's called that. Um, can I show you a little flyer for the play? Can you see that? Just about, yeah. Oh, it'll be backwards, of course, yeah. Um, no, no. Anyway, Music for Dogs um, is about a woman recording a message for her brother and sister from whom she's estranged, um, telling them that she's going to leave them money in her will. Um, we don't realise it quite but she is actually terminally ill and she has made a fortune and she's leaving it to them but she's not leaving it to them until she tells them exactly what she thinks of them because they have actually been horrible to her throughout her life um, and the title comes from the actual business venture she happened upon by accident uh, which was selling cds of music for dogs I don't want to say too much more than that no, because no. it would actually kill the joke. No. Um, but it's a very funny story. How And it, it did, like my own life, I suppose, it did kind of happen. It grew from nothing, um, almost by accident. And um, the play, of course, is about more than that. It was set during the, the early years of the Celtic Tiger when really Ireland lost its soul and people lost the run of themselves and became very materialistic and you know who's building what extension and whatever and it was all about property and money and it was horrible um so it's, it kind of reflects a disdain for that sort of culture as well um but basically it's a very human funny heartbreaking at times story uh but it's got very dublin wit paula is a very dublin poet and playwright uh, she was professor of poetry in Ireland when this was being performed. Um, but it's a, a wit and a humour that I think translates it's around the does. world. It certainly mm. does. It's a, it's a classic shaggy dog story, in fact. It, well, it is, literally <laughs> and metaphorically, yes. 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 But it's, yes. Got, it's got a very serious human story and a very funny dog story. Yeah, yes. And that's perfect. A clever combination <laughs> of those two that really makes it work. So I do hope once this interview is over, that you'll go and look for it on YouTube. Natalie will tell you exactly where to find it and give yourself, make a cup of tea and sit down for half an hour and really enjoy Carol's acting. So the, I wanted to ask you, you, you told me once a little bit about how you and um, Paul, you and Annie prepared for this because you weren't living in the same place at the, at the time, were you? No, we weren't. My screen has gone funny. Can you hear me? Well, I can see, I can see you and hear you. Oh, that's OK. That's fine. Yeah. Um, yes, it was a very long process and not one that you could replicate in the professional theatre or even in the in the amateur theatre, I don't think. Um, we found the play and um, 
Annie said she loved it. And I said, OK, next time I'm over in Ireland, we'll get together and talk about it. So at the time, my sister Sheila uh, was having her cancer treatment in Dublin um, and working with Annie from time to time over in Ireland gave me a reason to, to go over and spend time with Sheila that didn't, you know, necessarily speak, oh, I'm coming over to see you because you're dying sort of thing. It was um, a, a legitimate reason to go and to spend time with her, which was very, very precious. Now, Sheila, this whole process probably took about four or five years because it only happened every now and then. And in between it all, um, unfortunately, Sheila and Linda, who was only diagnosed as Sheila was dying, as terminally ill herself, they both died. And I'd been doing this off and on with Annie for a few years, mainly because I wanted them to see it. So it was very hard that they didn't, but I didn't want it all to go to waste, which I can come to later, which is why I was determined to make it happen. Basically, our way of working was quite experimental. Annie wanted to explore some things that she'd learned over the years with um, her work as a psychotherapist. And we sat in, Dub in Terra Neur's Bushy Park, which was near where I lived, my, my, my family had lived and where my, my sister lived, sitting watching the ducks um, and read through the script once just to time it. And that reading just sitting there with no pauses or moving or anything was about 25 minutes. So Annie said to me then, I want you to put that away and not look at the script again. So I said, okay. And we, over the next few years, uh, over Skype, sometimes she would Skype me. Um, and when we weren't uh, in the same country, we used Skype or telephone when that would break down. When I was over in Ireland, I went down to her in Greystones, or we stayed at a hotel in Dublin once. She had some vouchers for something or other. We said, let's use them to stay and work in a hotel for a change. Um, we did anything but look at the script. We uh, explored Janie. She wanted to give me the security of knowing Janie inside and out as a person. Hey, Janie is the character. The, the as the person, sorry, Janie is the character, yes. J Jane MacDonald and Janie Mac is a kind of a Dublin expression, but she's known as Janie. She wanted me to know Janie as well as I knew myself really. So that when I was on stage, saying the actual script, I would know where I was. I would know who she was. And I would not be terrified if anything went wrong with the lines. Um, she just wanted us to take our time, basically, let the process develop organically. And she used things like, um, she'd call me over Skype and say, okay, go to the piano and play Janie's party piece. So I'd have no preparation or anything. I would just instinctively react to whatever she asked me to do. She said, tell me about what Janie's nightmare last night. Um, so I'd tell her about that or I'd write it out as automatic writing often. Um, she would say, put Janie in a particular situation and say, well, what happened next? And I'd have to explain or write a little play about it. I created a lot of written work. Um, I did a lot of just off the cuff sort of speaking, off the cuff writing. Um, and then when I was in Dublin with her, um, or Greystones is south of Dublin, it's County Wicklow. When I was in Dublin City at the time we were staying in the hotel, we went uh, around the streets where Janie would have lived. Um, I took a train out to the Borough Beach, which is where the play is set. It's a beach on the north side of Dublin. Um, I went into a travel agent and I booked a holiday as if I were Janie. Another time I did back out at the last minute of this. I went into a church as <laughs> Janie. She was following me all the time, taking notes and so on. Um, I like I got into a sort of a mental state, uh, you know, a way of thinking as Janie and in a particular situation. I went into church. And I was going to shout at God as Janie and she Annie was fascinated she said oh this is brilliant with you know to herself she said to me afterwards but I backed out I couldn't <laughs> do it that's where the where the dichotomy between Carol and Janie actually you know became evident I yeah. lost my bottle and Carol do it. I think I think no part in a play has ever been so thoroughly prepared for and that's <laughs> partly because although you had the disadvantage of 
coming to it not as a professional as having to earn your living by it, you also had the advantage that you weren't actually, you know, you didn't have a time scale within which you had to do it. So true, true. But the, but the other thing, once you'd done it, once you'd got into the part, once you knew it, mm -hmm. um, making opportunity to perform it is the other thing because yeah. it's like mm -hmm. like we we're saying about poetry. Very, very few people buy poetry books. How are you going to project as a poet? And how, mm. how did you find the opportunities? I, well, I, we're, yeah. we're moving slightly to wanting to leave a little time for questioning. So okay. we need to do this one a bit quicker. Okay, right. Basically, again, it's like creating your own work, creating your own uh, opportunities. Um, I decided I wanted to do it, get it on the road, even though the people I most wanted to see it had gone. So I asked, Annie and I had moved on to different things. In the meantime, I asked my sister-in-law, David's wife in Paris, who is a director, which he directed. So we had a couple of weekends in Dublin and Paris and she directed me as, as much as possible. I still didn't know the lines at that stage. She was running the summer school in Allahy. So we decided that would be our world premiere in this tiny village, farthest village from Dublin on the map of Ireland. That would be the world premiere of Music for Dogs and Paula Meehan would be in the audience as well because she was down during the course. So I had something to aim for at a time frame. Totally self-funded. I, I fund borrowed or my husband gave me money to have the flats made, the, you know, the the posters, flyers, all of that self-funded. I didn't apply for funding because it's such hassle and I couldn't take on the stress of that as well. I decided you could, as an artist, apply for funding. I couldn't put myself through it. I said, look, I'll do it as cheaply as I can. I'll get banners, very simple set, and we'll go to Alley's, which could be a holiday anyway, an excuse to go and do it there. So that was the first gig. When I came back and then a friend saw that there was an old building in Shrewsbury was being uh, renovated. I went along to see if they would allow me to do it for lunchtime, a run of lunchtimes there. Uh, it was half finished the building, but we got a crowd in and sold out on the Saturday. Um, I then applied to local festivals like the Ludlow Fringe and so on, got a gig there. Worked myself up to the Edinburgh Fringe, which was a big, big commitment financially and time wise. Got a run there. It was hellish work. Uh, really, really, I felt my 60 year old knees and ankles, you know, traipsing around, giving out flyers and so on. Um, lived on, we stayed in an apartment that was on the fifth floor, I had no lift, and I injured my knee the very first night. Uh, so I was going around on a walking stick for the two weeks. Got reviews though, I did it to get reviews, um, which I then could tack on to other approaches to other festivals that I did. Um, so it was a question of knocking on doors saying, you know, you have a festival on, this play would be perfect, this is it, this is what BBC Radio Scotland have said about it, and so on and so on. A lot of the time you don't hear back from them. Sometimes you do get a gig. Sometimes you create them yourself. Um, I've done it back in, in Alahy's again. I've been to a lot of festivals around UK. I've still to do a proper Dublin performance. And when I get a Dublin run, I will retire. The play. <laughs> well, I think it's a good point at which we, we can pause for a moment and okay. see whether there are people with questions that they'd like to ask you. Um, and I hope there are. I hope there are, and I think this is here comes right. So um, um, I'm looking at, I think these are things that have been put up by Natalie. And any questions from anybody? Now, Natalie, we need you in the background checking this out for me because I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, well, somebody's. Okay, which is your greater love, poetry or acting? This is Jenny Lee asking you. I think now poetry, but if you'd asked me a few years ago, it would have been acting. I'm hoping I can keep both going, but I think if the house were on fire, I'd probably bring my writing chops and not my <laughs> acting chops. <laughs> But you, but you because carry you can still do that. I mean, if you can find a one woman play and somebody to direct it and a few bob to get it on, that's fine. But you can still always write poetry. You just need a notebook and a pencil. Yes, and 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 people to listen. They both need people to listen, don't they? True, 
Sure. Yes. But you can, mm. but I think sure. it's, I think the story of what's happened in Shrewsbury and Shropshire generally is wonderful. That mm. lots of people have started writing poetry and been a supportive supportive group for each other and helped each other. Yeah. It's a very, very uncompetitive, very supportive environment. I was it really is. I was yeah. really struck by it. Um, so Susan Truman is saying, are your children creative too? Not in an obvious way yet. They're both they're 25 and 27 now 28 nearly um my son plays guitar my daughter plays uh, piano but as far as being extrovert with any of it really not um but it's early days i think in a strange way i mean i came quite late to to doing what i'm doing now um but they're certainly appreciative of of the arts i think without necessarily being doers themselves it's a whole lifetime story of how how anybody mm. gets into it, isn't it? So yeah, yeah. Mm. And I, I I'm wondering um, if you look back, it's it's been about fifteen years, would you say? Both the poetry and the and the, the acting being yeah. part of your life again. You know, I was I was trying to work out some dates with my husband Brian earlier, mm. and certainly the Edinburgh Fringe was twenty fifteen. And I think the world premiere was 2014. David died in 2007, in Peter's year, 11. Mm. Certainly, yeah, I had started writing between 2007 and 2011, and I got much more serious after that. So the past so 10 you, years have look, been serious. If you look back on this, that's like 13 years at the most. If you look back on that, what, what have been the hardest things for you, do you think? Hmm about getting Sometimes all it's very hard to keep going when you get rejection mm. there have been one or two times with something i've sent off that i was sure was right for something or a festival that music for dogs would have been perfect for and they've said no and for some reason those particular rejections have hit hardest and harder than other things mm -hmm. and i was on the verge of giving up once or twice Mm -hmm. So it is hard to pick yourself back up again. The hard thing is not doing it in a strange way as well. Mm -hmm. When I'm writing or if I'm, you know, working on a rehearsal, I feel so much better. And well, I don't... Fact, Carol, there's a question which taps into that. Do you manage oh, to work every day or is it very much, um, you know, as and when you have time and feel moved to do it? I try and do something every day. Um, because it makes me feel better, I think, but also because I enjoy it. I'm very easily distracted. Um, you know, that quote from Harold Pinter is it, you know, the playwright suddenly struck by the absolute importance of going out and getting that light bulb. You know, anything <laughs> to free yourself from the death. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I do do tend to do something every day. It might be tiny or it might be reworking something. Um, and I'm, I'm glad of an excuse sometimes to put it off, but then I start feeling a certain malaise and, oh, you know, and then it's only afterwards I twig, it's because I've not been working on something. <laughs> and suddenly you get energized again. So, so both for selfish reasons to feel better, but also for, you know, for good self-discipline, it's, it's good to try and do something every day, I think. And I think, so for me, certainly it helps to, have the time of day when you do it. I, I work yeah. in the mornings. It's just Me too. my brain only works in the mornings actually by the afternoons is giving up. So it's no point. Me too. Up. Yeah. Me too. And it kind of works in our house. We have the, the computer set up in the room opposite me here, the den we call it. it, used to be the garage. And I tend to write on a computer, which really poetry should be written longhand, I'm told, but I tend oh. to write. <laughs> and the mornings is free. Later in the day, my husband tends to be in there as he is now, you know, doing things with music and computers and or watching mm -hmm. football. So it suits our rhythms. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, if I haven't worked in the morning or if there's something else in the morning distracting me, the day is lost. Well, that comes to another question. This one's from Sonia. How have you found lockdown? Sounds like you and Brian have found a way of using the house creatively. Well, to be honest, I have to say I am very, very lucky compared to so many other people. 
lockdown hasn't meant a huge difference to our lives. I'm not missing a lot of things. That, 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 and that's partly the age we are, isn't it, Carol? It's partly the age we are that we live a quiet life, Brian. You know, we didn't do an awful lot of going out before this. So obviously that is gone, but there isn't enough of it to be a huge gap in our lives. I haven't been as creative as some people have been. It's been a process of shock and absorbing it and terror at the beginning and my god is this the end of the world to okay let's narrow things down and let's see how we get through what we can get through um lots of people i know have written novels and got really fit and, and painted their house and you know i've just kind of paused and been almost paralyzed while i, I think that's it all. very common i think that's really very, very bit guilty common. about that. I mm. wouldn't, I wouldn't. And you, I'm going to pause myself now because I think it would be really, there are a couple more questions, but I think it would be really lovely for people to hear you read one of your poems. Could you do that for us? Oh, right. Okay. Where did I put the book? Um, right. Um, you, we you. don't have much time, so choose a short one. I'll choose a very short one. It's called The Moorings, and it's the poem that gives the title to the book. The moorings. Before you read it, Carol, do you want to say anything about what it's about? Because sometimes that helps people listen. I, I think it's fairly self-evident, to be honest. Sometimes okay. things need an explanation. I don't think this one does. Okay. Some lives fall lightly on this earth, leaves on a summer breeze, dancing. Some cast up hard on a place of high sorrow, slow swell of ice flow, melting. This feels like freefall in that untethered space between then and now, drifting. Help me, love, to stay afloat and show me how to live once more without your heartbeat in the house, keening. Now, Carol, in, in Urdu poetry, they have a tradition where they read it twice which I think is wonderful because the first time you're taking in something general about it and the second time you can listen to the detail more. So if you can read it another time, we'd be grateful. Sure, we do that at Wenlock Poetry Breakfast as well when we were able to meet. The moorings. Some lives fall lightly on this earth, leaves on a summer breeze, dancing. Some cast up hard on a place of high sorrow, slow swell of ice flow, melting. This feels like freefall in that untethered space between then and now, drifting. Help me, love, to stay afloat and show me how to live once more without your heartbeat in the house, keening. It's beautiful. I don't know if you're choking up, but I am. And I think that might be a good moment to stop. So, Carol, thank you so much. It's been really lovely to have you sharing your story. And um, for somebody who describes herself as shy, you've been extremely generous in talking about very personal things with us. And I'm sure a lot of people will be, you know, who'll have been entertained and touched. And thank you so much. Thank you, Marion, for, for being a lovely interviewer. And I do hope people go to the YouTube channel of, of the Register and watch the show. I do hope so. And also, um, Carol, um, uh, if somebody wants to comment or ask a question after seeing the show, is there a way they can do that, Carol? Yes, um, I'm not sure if Natalie has shared my email address, but I'll show it here. It's music for dogs one at gmail.com. Move it into the middle of the screen and we move it down and into the middle of the screen, more to the, more to your left and up. <laughs> there we go. Music for dogs one at gmail.com. Okay, so you can send, if you'd like to say anything more to Carol after seeing the show, do send her an email there. The, I, I would love to hear from people and the, the publisher's website is forward.org, the figure four. Um, but yes, I'd love if people have questions or or any reactions they'd like to let me know of, I'd be delighted to hear from you. I and think thank you, Marion and Natalie and, and the register for, for having me along. 
Well, it's been delightful. And I think one of the things you've, you've really highlighted is that this distinction between professional and amateur is a nonsense. We mm. are creative people. Um, we are all creative in different ways and we all have things within us that we can work on and find a way to express. And when we've shared it, we've been creative. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.